Good morning, Year Six. We are on Chapter Three of Sky Song today. Does everybody want to say hello? Hi. <laughs> um, so, just a quick recap then before we get started. So, if you remember, Flint was our character that we got introduced to in Chapter Two. Okay, and he is able to wield magic, isn't he? Okay. Um, everybody else has given up on magic and they believe that it's bad, but he doesn't, and he has used it to break into Winterfang. And what did he find when he broke into Winterfang? He found the girl who was trapped in the magic box and she was asking his kids for help. Fantastic. He, um, he found the girl who was... Just sit still for me because I'm making a video. So we did it aloud. Um, he found the little girl, didn't he? He found the girl, Eska, trapped inside the music bo uh, box and she spoke. And she spoke. Yeah, she said, help me. So we now know that she does have a voice and the voice is what the Ice Queen wants. Yes, exactly. So she knows how to break the spell now. She just needs Flint to help her um, and she needs to get out of Winterfang. So chapter three, Flint. For a moment, Flint did nothing at all. He just stared at the girl in front of him. Her body was almost blue from the chill, but she wasn't shivering. She was absolutely still like a doll. Only her face seemed alive. Turn the key in the pedestal. Three turns to the right, half a turn to the left. Flint frowned. The girl's voice was hoarse and weak, but there was something strangely magnetic about it. And despite the dangers all around him, he found himself drawn to her words. Please, the girl begged. It will undo the spell. Shaking himself, Flint gathered his rope into his rucksack, slipped off his cramp cramp crampons and dropped down into the hall. He couldn't risk being seen by the Tusk guards, but still he said nothing. Who was this girl? Flint's mind raced as he took in her shock of red hair. The tusks were blonde, the furs had brown hair, and the feathers all had hair the colour of midnight. The girl didn't fit. But those eyes, big and bright and blue, brought back memories of the tusk spies Flint had seen in the forest last month. And if this girl was a tusk spy, he wasn't getting mixed up with her, not when he had a rescue mission ahead of him. He took a step into the hall and felt Pebble tense inside his hood. Who's Pebble? Remember, I am? It's, it's not a wolf. It's not a wolf. It's a fox. It's an arctic fox. So it's a white fox and it's a fox pup. So um, it's only a baby one. And he was hiding, wasn't he, inside of his hood. So Flint and obviously Pebble um, are companions. They travel together. He took a step into the hall and felt Pebble tense inside his hood. The fox pup's ears were trained to sounds most humans missed and Flint listened hard until he too could make out the faint tapping noise like metal clanging from deeper within the palace. The girl blinked frightened eyes at Flint. Please, she said, there isn't much time. Despite the pull of her voice, Flint took a few more nervous steps over to the ice-crusted floor, past the organ in the middle of the room, below the chandelier spread with candles that burnt with bright blue flames and on towards the silver trees and the doorway leading further into the palace. Somewhere beyond that door was his ma. I know I don't look or sound like much, the girl whispered from behind him. For some reason, the Ice Queen thinks my voice is important. Flint kept walking, but his ears snagged on those last words, because with every sentence this girl uttered, he could feel himself being folded further into her story. Her voice, whether he liked it or not, did seem to hold some quiet sort of power. I know things from being locked up here in this palace, she went on, and if you set me free, I can help you find whoever you've come for. The girl stifled a, um, a sob, and Flint recognised something in her then, something desperate, some, uh, despite her stillness, like the beating fear in the eyes of a wounded animal, and it was harder to keep walking than he had expected. He, flew a, he, f he threw a glance over his shoulder. What's your name? Eska. And your tribe? There were tears standing in Eska's eyes now. I... I don't remember a tribe. The Ice Queen took my memories when she locked me in the music box. Everyone belongs to a tribe. Flint looked her up and down and the hardness closed back around him. Tusk, probably. We all know the only reason Tusk children roam without fear is because they're the Ice Queen's spies and their parents are her guards. He turned away and concentrated on the hall. It was detours like this, a term his parents had come up with for the, for the distracted, almost sideways nature of his adventures that always got him into such a mess. So a detour is when you do something you're not supposed to do. Um, so his he, his mission was to save his ma, and actually he's been detoured already, hasn't he, by finding Eska. The detours were also the reason why Tomkin had carved the words, decide where you're going and go there on the runners of his sled. The trouble was, 
Flint realised as he tiptoed over the ice, he usually only discovered where he was going halfway through a journey. And when he arrived, he was often some way he hadn't intended to be. But this was a journey to bring back his ma, and he wasn't going to let a stranger, who he didn't even know and didn't even have a tribe, let get in his way. He took a few steps across the room, mumbling to himself as he went, stupid tusk spy. But even as he said the words, he knew they weren't true. The girl was afraid, really afraid, and Flint had done enough hunting to know what fear looked like. What if she was really the Ice Queen's prisoner and, he, and he knew, she knew things that Tomkin needed to hear to stage his rebellion? Flint dug his nails into his hands. He could sense there was something more to the girl than what he was seeing. Find Mar first, he murmured. Pebble, though, had other ideas. Wriggling free from Flint's hood, the fox put dropped down to the ground and ran up to the pedestal. Pedal, Flint hissed. We need to go. Try and sit still for me. But the fox pup was clambering up to the pedestal now, and Flint watched open mouthed as Pebble raised a tentative paw towards Esker. The little animal was usually cautious and untrusting around those he didn't know, and yet with Esker he didn't seem afraid. Flint watched as Pebble rubbed his body against the girl's dress and then licked her ice cold toes before turning to Flint and making a noise that sounded like a huff. We don't even know what tribe she's from, Pebble. Even if she's not working for the Ice Queen, she could be dangerous. He glanced across the hall towards the door between the silver trees. Come on! But the fox put wove between Esker's legs and turned his twitching nose back to Flint. The boy grimaced. Tomkin had reminded him only the day before about harassing the mind of a warrior, harnessing the mind of a warrior, becoming silent and focused and deadly. He cursed under his breath. What he was about to do was not focused, and he was decidedly undeadly. He hurried back to the pedestal and placed a hand on the jet black key. Esker's eyes glinted, glinted, glittered, and though her words were faint, she whispered her plea. Three turns to the right and half a turn to the left. Flint shot Pebble a withering look. It's your fault if this all goes wrong, he said. Pebble flicked his tail defiantly. Then Flint's mitten closed around the key and he turned it, just the way Esker had said. For a few seconds, there was a grinding sound, like musical notes draining away. Then there was a click as the key finally rotated left. Esker slumped on the pedestal, and for a moment, Flint wondered whether he'd killed the girl. A death on the top of a detour would be hard to explain to Tomkin. But then slowly, shakily, Esker raised her head. She looked at her hands first, turning them this way and that. She couldn't believe that they belonged to her, and then she flexed her toes. Thank you, she gasped. Thank you. But as she struggled to her feet, the whispers began. Flint jerked his head upwards. They were coming from the blue candles flickering in the chandelier. Come to the hall, the candles have spoken. The curse of the child has now been broken. Again and again, the flames whispered, and Flint's blood curdled. He scooped Pebble up into his hood and turned to Esker. You didn't tell me the candles were spies. Esker staggered off the pedestal, then fell to her knees, under the strain of using muscles so long locked under a spell. She scrabbled to the wall and hurled herself up. I, I didn't know, she stammered, and then her voice grew louder, and she glanced at the archers. We have to leave. Flint's jaw stiffened. I'm here to free my ma, and you're going to show me how I get through this palace to the ice towers like you promised. Chapter 4 Esker shook her head. You don't know the Ice Queen like I do. We won't stand a chance now she knows I'm free. Pebble slid further into Flint's hood, as if he could sense that there was large, he was largely to blame for this, return, this turn of events, while Flint's eyes faltered between the arch he had come through and the door leading into the heart of Winterfang. He stormed across the hall towards the latter, leaving Esker trembling beside the music box. But as Flint approached the doorway, the silver branches closed over the frame, barring his way to the palace. And then footsteps, footsteps sounded from a passageway beyond the door, heels clanking closer, followed by the slow swish of a gown. The stories of the Ice Queen swirled inside of him. She wears a dress made of the frozen tears of her prisoners. She can hex animals under her control, and one strike of her staff, she can turn children to ice. Flint thought of the inventions he had packed in his rucksack, his camouflage cape made from fur of a snow hare, then washed in a basket of sunbeams, and his bone-handled anything knife was a turquoise river gem slotted into the handle. But these inventions had been made to help Flint slip through the passageways unseen, not to fight the Ice Queen. And from an aching heart, he realised his rescue mission now lay in tatters at his feet. He raced back towards the arches. 
Panes of black glass ice were shielding across them, closing the hall in, window by window. The palace darkened as the sunlight was shut out, but Flint spread across towards the third arch, still left open, and grabbing the key from the music box, Eska stumbled after him. You are not coming with us, Eska cri uh, Flint cried as he hoisted himself into the biggest arch and hauled the rope from his rucksack. You've already ruined my chances of freeing my mark. The footsteps beyond the hall grew louder and the flames began to hiss. Flint flung his barred rope into the wall, then glanced towards the tundra. The guards didn't seem to be out there any longer. Sit down. Thank you. Perhaps they were inside the palace now, having summoned the Ice Queen about the strange whistling sound over the ice, and Flint knew that he only had a few seconds to make his escape work. The black ice burst out from the side of the arch and Flint gripped onto the rope and began to abseil down the palace wall. So the queen is blocking all of the light, okay? She's, she's basically filling up all the windows with black ice. So they are going to be trapped in the hall. So if he doesn't escape quickly, he's going to end up being trapped there, isn't he? Okay, so he's thrown his rope out and abseiling is when you climb down a wall, okay? So he's abseiling down the wall, hopefully trying to escape. But Eska wasn't giving up. She clambered onto the arch in the nick of time. Her body juddered from the cold and Flint watched a gust as she grabbed hold of the rope above him as the last of the windows sealed shut behind her. Flint slid, slid to the ground, barely using his mittened or his boots to grip the rope this time. And moments later, Eska clattered down after him, her hands and feet raw from the rope. Then there was an almighty crash as the largest pane of black glass smashed apart. Flint dragged Eska beneath the bridge. He couldn't let her go now. She'd only give away his presence. And yet his mission was careering sideways. He hauled a bundle of clothes from his rucksack, a pair of sealskin boots and mittens and a parka, and trousers made from grizzly bear furs, and tossed them at Eska. They were for my ma, he growled, but you'll need them if you're going to make it out of this alive. He drew out a large and very soft white blanket next. The camouflage came. I didn't need this on the way here because no one knew I was coming. But now, thanks to you, he shook his head. We need to run, and fast, beneath the cliffs. And if we stay under this cape, we'll have a chance of making it unseen. Flint jumped as a high-pitched cry pierced the night. Eska! The voice was sharp and shrill, and it swarmed over the driftlands. Flint slid a look up to the palace to see a woman standing at the tallest arch. A crown of snowflakes glittered on her head, his insides clenched. The Ice Queen's teardrop ground fluttered in the wind, and beside the staff she held sat a wolverine, its dark fur a strain against the ice. A wolverine is like a huge wolf. Flint turned to Eska, tucking her beneath the camouflage cape with him. Run, he whispered. Now. And with the sound of the Tusk Guards marching over, the, over across the bridge and the Ice Queen's screech echoing across the kingdom, the two children darted out. They kept to the cliffs, their boots pounding against the ice, their breath pent up inside them. And though Eska was unstable on her feet, Flint propped her up and they ran on towards the cabin where the huskies waited. Flint yanked Eska inside the opening of the cliff and the dogs clust clustered around them, warm and loyal, ready for the homeward journey. Eska leant against the wall, free from winter fangs, she panted in disbelief. Free at last, the Ice Queen's voice tore across the ice again and Eska edged further into the cabin. Stand on the metal brake beside the runner while I attach the dogs, Flint muttered. I don't want them whisking the sled away before we're ready to go. So on a sledge, there's like a bit that sticks out and you have to stand on it and it stops the sledge from, from going or the dogs from pulling the sledge before you're ready. Okay, so he's asked her to stand on it. Eska hurried over and pressed down on her boot, but after the Ice Queen's enchantment, her body was no match for the spirited dogs. They brake flung up and the sled jerked forward and Eska stumbled over, but Flint was on it in a second, slamming a hand on the side of the sled until it had stopped. Eska picked herself up and wedged her foot down over the metal again as hard as she could. That cape, she whispered, nervously placing her other boot on the brake to stop it, edging forward. We never would have escaped without it. And if it was made of magic, wasn't it? That's what it was. That's the reason we got away. For a second, Flint's shoulders squared with pride. It was the first time anyone had congratulated him on an invention, or even barely vaguely interested in Urkelmold's magic since the, since the Tusk Chief's death. But then he remembered himself, and he scowled. Shut up and listen to me. He stamped his boot over Eskers so that it sank deep into the snow and the sled felt held firm. The cabin widens into a tunnel, and when it comes up onto the tundra, we'll be safe distance away from the palace. The guards might see the huskies, but if we and the sled are tucked under the cape, they'll just look like a pack of wolves running from the distance. And with any luck, we'll make it to Deep Roots without being tailed. Eska nodded. 
We must be quick, though. We need to get out as far as we can while the night hides us. Esker nodded again. Avoiding Flint's eyes, she whispers, What's deep roots? What's deep roots? Flint scoffed as he untangled the ropes that tied the dogs to his sled. Only the biggest forest in the kingdom and the home to the legendary fur tribe. Everyone in Erkenwald knows that. Everyone except me, Esker mumbled. A spot of colour had returned to her cheeks, but the clothes she wore swamped her body and she looked pitifully frail besides them. Will I be safe with your tribe? Flint looked up. You can't just wander in and join our tribe. There are rules, you know. But, Esker's voice trailed off. I'll be extra pair, it'll be an extra pair of hands. I could help around the place. I'd be helpful, I promise. It doesn't work like that, Flint said. You have to be one of us from the start. He tossed his rucksack on the fur-lined sled. Once you're in deep roots, you're on your own. I don't know who you are, what tribe you're from, or why the Ice Queen thinks your voice is important. But I just missed my chance at freeing my mob because of you. The only reason I'm not leaving you here is because I don't trust you not to blab about my whereabouts to the Ice Queen. Pebble yapped as Flint's hood. And because Pebble is playing up, Pebble growled. Flint sighed. And I suppose because you might know things that could help us fight the Ice Queen. Satisfied now, Pebble settled into Flint's hood. Flint shoved Esker off the brake, pushed his own foot down on it, and, gla and glowed as the ball and, and glowed and glowered at the ball of the white fur curled up in his hood. I blame you entirely for this detour, Pebble. You're going to have some serious explaining to do when we see Tomkin. Pebble pretended to snore, and Flint rolled his eyes. But then the wolverine's growl ju juddered across the sea outside, and he pointed at the sled. Sit down on the furs in front. Flint lifted the, ca the, the camouflage cape over his shoulders, and hold the end of the cape up over a little so that I can see out ahead of us. He paused. But don't expect any conversations. It's hard to steer a sled. Be cross and talk all at the same time. Can, can I just ask your name? Esker stammered. Flint scowled. Why do you need it? Esker blinked. In case we do decide to have more conversations. <sighs> it's Flint. There was a pause. And we won't be having any more conversations. Not for a while at least. Esker nodded meekly. Then Flint lifted his boot from the brake. And as the dog hastened into the tunnel... The wolverine's growl penetrated the silence. Chapter 5 They emerged from the tunnel, and when Esker eventually plucked up the courage to peek out from the cape and glance over her shoulder, she saw the dark shapes of the Tusk Guard spreading out over the driftlands in the opposite direction. Relief rinsed through her, and she slipped back beneath the blanket. She felt her pulse and whined. With every stride the dogs took, she was moving further and further away from the woman who had held her captive for so long. The, wood, the, wooden cled, the wooden sled creaked as it rushed over the ice and the cold air funnelling through the cape stiffened her muscles in Esker's face. But for the first time since being locked inside the Ice Queen's music box, Esker smiled because she had escaped, finally. And the landscape she had watched in silence for so long was now alive all around her. Her heart fluttered at the, as the freedom of it all and she wiggled her hands in front of her chest. What are you doing? Flint hissed. Esker did a little circle with her elbow. Getting used to my body again. Well, don't, Flint spat. It's distracting. Sit still. Esker stared ahead for a few minutes and tried her best not to be annoying. Then very quietly, she began tracing her fingers over her arms and legs for a mark from the sky gods that might show she was cursed. But she found nothing, so she went back to very subtly circling her elbows instead. Snow clouds are gathering, Flint whispered to himself. Our tracks will be covered by morning. Esker stole a look at the night sky and she watched the dark closing in as she tried to work out whether Flint's words were an opening to a conversation or not. She had no reason to trust him after all. He hadn't planned to rescue her. It had just sort of happened. But without Flint, she'd still be trapped inside Winterfang. And though she didn't want to irritate him, she was longing to talk to somebody, someone after so many months of silence. She had to know more about the fur and the feather tribe children. Where were they hiding? Might they bend their rules and offer her shelter and protection? Could she team up with them to fight against the Ice Queen? And her deepest despair of all, would they know who she really was? She took the music box key into her pocket, hoping now that she had the Ice Queen, that the Ice Queen would not be able to use the music box again for her or anyone else. Tell me about those in hiding from the Ice Queen, Esker said quietly. That sounds dangerously like a conversation to me, Clint replied, urging the dogs on. There were no fences or roads on the Driftland, at least none that Esker could see beyond the gap in the cape and the moonlight was almost completely swallowed by the clouds now, but it seemed Flint knew his wide and lonely landscape. Somehow, its shapes and rhythms were locked in his skull, and he swerved the sled through the scattering of trees, then down a hollow bank until it skidded out into a frozen river coated in snow. 
Please tell me, Eska whispered, because if you're planning to leave me, I need more information than I have right now to survive. Why does the Ice Queen think your voice is important? Flint muttered. It's not like other voices, I give you that, but it's feeble all the same. And don't even and you don't even know anything. Eska was almost afraid of the answer, of the darkness that the Ice Queen said her voice was capable of. But she had the boy's attention now, and she wanted to keep it. The Ice Queen is feeding on her prisoners' voices, Eska watched the river race beneath the dog's paws. And if she can swallow every voice in Erkamore before midnight, sunrises, she'll become immortal, and she will rule this kingdom forever. Eska heard the squeak of mittens tightening around the wooden bar behind him, behind her, but when Flint spoke, his voice betrayed no emotion. What's that got to do with you? Why is your voice any more important to her than any other prisoners? Eska took a deep breath. The Ice Queen told me that the Sky Gods placed a curse on my voice to make it capable of terrible things. She promised to help me. She said she would take away my cursed voice and use it to summon the outlawed tribes, then tear down the Sky Gods so that they could never harm Urkenwald again. Flint didn't reply. And as Eska listened to the near-silent sound of snow pattering against the cape, she wondered what he was thinking. Could he sense the shame in her voice at the idea that she might be cursed? Was he planning to tip her off the sled and leave her for dead because of it? The silence was broken by a snigger. No one believes in the Sky Gods or their magic anymore. Not after the Northern Lights stopped. And Eska saw her chance. Will you still believe? In their magic at least, she paused. Back at the palace, I saw a lot of dark magic. But what if there's another kind of magic out there? One that could be used for good? One that could be harnessed to make a secret capes? She bit her lip. Because that's what you did, isn't it? You used magic to outwit the ice cream. Flint shift, shifted behind her. I can't remember anything about my past, Eska went on. The ice queen stole my memories. But I get a feeling about things deep in my gut. And somehow, I never believed her when she blamed the gods for the tribes hating each other. I reckon that was her doing. I think the sky gods are still up there. And their magic might be something we can trust after all. Okay, I'm going to finish there. So we are halfway through chapter five um, and we will finish it this afternoon. So I'll post another video finishing chapter five and reading chapter six later on. Have a lovely day. Bye.